You don't get depressed if a reply rate is initially low. You do a thorough research and then you realize, okay, there are 20 channels and my customers are active on these eight. I have eight channels, but I have 10 hours a day or 24 hours a day if you're a lunatic. And how, how can I maximize the impact? Community is 24 seven. Like I join a community on a Monday and there are no po posts till Thursday. There's only 50 members and nobody's active. Those are the typically challenges you face when you're doing it from scratch. You can run Facebook ads for a month or two. They might not bring results. People who are running them are people who are not that experienced in it. And then they label Facebook ads as yeah, they're not working. It's not that they're not working. It's that we don't know how to utilize them. You want to have something that's uniquely different about you. It doesn't have to be like an amazing feature. It can be just that your tool is faster. That could be a differentiation. Welcome back to the SDR Hire podcast. This week, we have another different concept. I'm interviewing a friend of mine who has a marketing consulting business. Now, this interview is a part of a series of interviews I did with business owners with the goal of launching a completely new podcast called The Dropped Playbook. Now, I gave up on that podcast concept, but I didn't want to let those interviews go to waste. So in this episode, you'll be listening to Vuk, how he's growing his business and what impact he's made to other startups and businesses over his career. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. Vuk, welcome to The Drop Playbook. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thanks for the invite and hell of an intro. Sounds about <laughs> right. Amazing, man. You and I have been friends and have known each other for quite some time now. But the first time that I actually heard of Vuk, I was back 2019. I just started working in a startup in Belgrade called Shift Moving. Mm. And I kept bumping into like people who keep repeating, oh, yeah, yeah that was Vuk. So, yeah, so Vuk <laughs> did this, Vuk did that. And so literally department after department, so marketing, sales, freaking finance, whoever I come across, it would be something Vuk did this, Vuk did that. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? And then I realized that that you went to Lemless and I obviously heard different stories. But yeah, like you have a quite a reputation around you wherever you go. And that reputation is the reason why I wanted to have this conversation today. And obviously all the things that you've done in your career, but how did you end up in uh, Shift in the first place? Thanks, man. I'm, I'm really always really happy when I hear that because I guess like in my mind, and it comes probably back to my parents is I like that feeling of good chemistry in the team, mm. no matter how cliche it sounds like, I think it's. You just like, you feel, you feel like a kid playing football with your friends and you're just enjoying everything. And if you like have a similar feeling in the office, I feel the best work comes from there. So I'm really happy when I hear uh, that's the case. After finishing uh, my bachelor's uh, in economics, I, I did like a little internship in finance, realized finance is not for me. And I worked in, uh, in an agency mm -hmm. and luckily had a wonderful first uh, boss that was uh, pure luck. I was recommended by a friend and I learned marketing like okay there are these channels i knew i'm always going to end up in marketing but i didn't really expect all this digital vibes back when i was younger and in an agency after a year i realized startups small companies this whole b2b notion sounds really interesting and there was an ad like a shift back then it was called crater before the rebranding and they were looking for a copywriter and in the agency, I was literally that, a copywriter for email marketing, email outreach, SEO content, and social media in general. So I was like, okay, I'm going to apply. And they invited me for an interview on a Saturday, which was the first time a company invited me to do an interview on a weekend. Sounds, like, hey. sounds promising. Yeah. And I'm like, these are my guys. I was, like we mentioned earlier, like a, a yes man. When I hear something really cool, I was really eager to show that I can do some good things in marketing. And I went and a couple of days later, I got a job offer and I joined. I wasn't in the first 10 employees in Serbia, but I was somewhere between 10 and 20. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent two years and a couple of months on top there and really enjoyed it with all the pluses and minuses i really enjoyed it and it prepared me for what came afterward real quick if you're a sales leader or you know someone who's looking for support when it comes to cold outreach cold calling cold email linkedin outreach 
we build SDR and BDR teams for companies or complement their existing teams with top talent, remote SDRs and BDRs that are exceptional in outreach skills. So if you'd like to get in touch, just visit sdrhire.com and book a call with our team. All right, back to the show. So knowing what kind of environment shift is or, or rather was, I can just assume what kind of an infrastructure it gave you to be able to transition to your next role, which was Lemlist. And obviously, I really want to focus on the things that you did there in this interview. Let's maybe just start with, and this is probably one of my favorite stories about you, which is how you actually ended up in Lemlist. So that's an unusual way of landing a job. And it's not something people even have guts to do, let alone actually do it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's one of my fondest stories. So Shift was specific, like marketing was specific. There are a couple of channels we were utilizing and marketing was, in essence, Robin to sales Batman. Mm. And we weren't doing a lot of creative work. And I was feeling like, okay, I need that because that's the direction I want to go to. And Shift, just because of the nature of the industry and the vision of the senior people in the company, it's just okay. Let's not do that. That was okay. And I asked, can I freelance on the side because I have additional hours in a day? And my boss like, okay, we don't have additional work for you. You can do it. And I was like working seven, eight hours for shift. And I had a room uh, to do two or three hours a day for you know for a company. And I was like, okay, shift gave me a good title. I had a good salary in general and I was fine. I was living a really decent life. And I started looking, okay, I have all the time in the world to figure out what I want to do next. And I was thinking about it for about a month and I realized, okay, now I've been in an agency a year, I've been in shift two plus years. And I was like, okay, I need a startup that just started that has a promising product in an industry I understand and I like enjoy, like I, I can understand customers. Moving industry wasn't an industry that they understood. I needed to learn the hard way because I never moved anybody apart from my parents and myself. And it was in Serbia. So you can imagine the difference between Serbia and the United States in terms oh, of yeah. moving. But, and then, yeah, that was one of the filters. Just, okay, fine. I need an industry just based on the shift experience that I, I understand. And luckily my LinkedIn feed back then was really optimized. I was seeing some really good stuff. And I saw a guy, Ogden, shout out to him. He tagged like 10 people. 10 founders, 10 entrepreneurs who are going to become excellent in the upcoming years. And one of the people who were tagged was Guillaume. Mm. Obviously, I looked at all the 10. I saw that Lemlist is in the cold email space. I was already doing outreach in a way with the sales team in Shift. And I was like, okay, I, I understand this. I like the tool. I like this custom image thing. So I started digging into the company and I was like, okay, they're doing exactly the marketing that I want to be doing. And they seem like cool. I said, okay, this could be the company. And I saw that they are not doing, obviously, because they're just the founders, three of them. And Guillaume was the only business person. The other two were tech people and thought it was funny to call email a cold email tool founder. I said, I want to be the Kobe Bryant of Lamlist. And I really meant that. I, I honestly believed, okay, there are things that need to happen. There are things I need to do. There are things they need to do for all that to click. But I was like, what the hell? I'm going to shoot my shot and send an email. Guillaume responded, I think, super fast. We hopped on a call tomorrow and I started freelancing and a couple of months later, they offered me to join as a head of growth, becoming their first employee. And for Lamlist in particular, I can say the rest is really history because the experience, it was phenomenal for me individually, for us as a team and for everybody who joined. I think it was awesome. Like that email was one of the smartest things Vuk did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Shout out to Vuk in 2018. Yeah. Yeah. 20. 2018, six years ago. <laughs> Jesus age Christ. Exactly. It was too long ago. And it's funny because so I was in, in shift in 2019 and 2020. Yeah. And at some point we were using uh, Lemlist to perform cold outreach. Do you want to hear a funny story about that? Yeah. Like I was freelancing for Lemlist like for, I, I forgot, six, seven, eight months, something like that before I moved full time. And November, the, I joined, I think March was mm. the month I joined, 2019. And so November, December, Lamlist became profitable or predictably profitable, as mm -hmm. I recall. 
like we started getting some users, some traction, light, nothing too fancy. And I was like, okay, the product is stable. I hate the tool that we were using. It was an email marketing tool that we were using for outreach. And I knew it was a mistake. Yep, that and I was like, okay, let me just buy Lemlist. And because you, we already started discussing potentially me moving to Lemlist, Guillaume was like, okay, Vuk selling Lemlist even before joining Lemlist full time. <laughs> and so it was me really who like bought that tool. And we were doing some sort of initiative with sales and Lemlist was producing results. That was my first sales. <laughs> I guess it foreshadowed your commitment, what Lemist uh, was becoming and what it became in the next few years. And just for reference sake, Lemlist is, I think, currently in tw at 23 million annual recurring revenue. Yeah. I think you left when they were at, I don't know, how big were they when you left? 13.5, if I'm not mistaken. I put Impressive. it on LinkedIn. So basically, you were there from like a few thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah to 13 and a half million dollars in annual yeah. recurring grind. That's it's, it's hard to comprehend, honestly. Yeah, it was awesome. And all right, all right. So I want to go come back to Lemlist. I just want to go through your r resume up until this point, and then we'll go back because there's a lot to uncover. So you basically left Lemlist. I think it was like a couple of years ago, something like 2022, that. If I'm 22. Correct. All right. Yeah. So more than a year ago. And then you went to, if I'm not mistaken, a company called Big Interview? Yeah, the company officially is called like Skillful Communications and they have a couple of products. Big Interview is their most popular product. So you could say Big Interviews. Got it. Got it. Which is, I, I think it's uh, an AI tool for that helps you prepare for interviews. Really. Yeah, yeah. It's a educational slash AI, like a mix of the two for interview preparation for B2C and B2B. Nice. And then you started your own consultancy, which you're running right now, correct? True that. All right. True so, that. so, but that was by mistake, dude. I honestly like when. How uh, do you start a business by mistake? Yeah, big interview, and I had a good breakup in June 2023. We just like an honest story is we realized that I want to do things that go a little bit to the left. They want to do things that go a little bit to the right. So we talked. I think in April or May, me and their CEO, and we decided, okay, let's finish Q2 leave everything in a good place for the team and like a good breakup. And then I was like, okay, I need a couple of months of not doing anything. I wanted to chill a little bit. Girlfriend and I were like remodeling a couple of things in our apartment. Let me finish that finally, because it was dragging for quite a bit of time. And I wanted to go to a few Inter games in Italy. So it was like, okay, three months, not doing anything. And then as I shared on LinkedIn that I'm leaving big interview, couple of interesting DMs started coming. I wasn't really ready uh, to accept anything full-time just mm -hmm. because I didn't want to jump right into another adventure without thinking about it. And then a week goes by and I was like, okay, maybe I can do some consulting. I was already doing mentorship for some of the marketers and entrepreneurs who are a few years behind me. And I was like, okay, maybe I can add this fancy fractional whatever, but it's like consulting. And that's how it started. Like I jumped, I think three weeks after I left a uh, big interview, I started working with two clients and had a couple of mentorships and like six months later, a couple of clients on the consulting side, a couple of clients on the mentorship side, business is profitable, clients are happy uh, so far. And uh, yeah, I don't, honestly, it was by accident, but it was a good accident. Are you then currently like a, a fractional marketing leader, is that kind of the model? Depends on the client. Mm. Like I have clients where we work as a unit, like there's no leader. We just have a project and everybody has certain ownership of, of certain things. I have some clients where I act as a part-time head of marketing or however you want to call it. Like there are so right. many titles now, it makes me sick. But yeah, one of the two of the clients I act as their fractional yeah, CMO, let's call it like that. That's very actually like you, very pragmatic, and you don't care about titles. You only care about impact. And that's something that I deeply respect about you and the way you do business and you do marketing. It's, it's not about the likes and the comments, and it's about the impact that you're making on the bottom line, as well as the impact that you're making, like tangible impact that your clients or rather your employers are feeling. So that's, and your customers for that matter. Because you swayed me into becoming a Lemlist customer because after I left uh, Shift, 
I, I got a job as a sales development representative, obviously doing cold emails, and I was able to persuade the company that, that I joined to start using Lemlist because like, I was completely sold. But maybe this is the reason, because you guys were literally jumping out of my fridge. <laughs> like Wherever I look, it was Lemlist, it was Guillaume, it was you, it was Nadia. It was like, like my whole LinkedIn feed was just Lemlist showing how there's a better way of doing cold outreach. And I was completely like charmed and I was just roasted. Thanks, man. We appreciate your trust. But yeah, like I have a brother who works in uh, Procter & Gamble and he lives in, in Geneva and he's not active on LinkedIn. He uses it passively and obviously like we're connected and all. And he started seeing all the Lemless content and we see each other like once or twice a year when mm -hmm. we're in the same country. And, I, and he was like, okay you're it's too much dude like I, i'm really considering unfollowing you <laughs> uh, can it really be too much though what do you think no i don't think so like i think it depends on the person like my brother is is not in that world uh, he does a completely different thing so for him it can be too much and you always have people who unfollow you which is the way it should work like you're not gonna please everybody mm. kind of makes sense uh, so unfollowing i don't take it really personally but Lamlist was always like a content-driven company. That was one of the critical things that attracted me to send Guillaume a message, uh, content that he was creating even in the early days, uh, the community, those types of things. And uh, he always had that ambition. There's like a sentence from a football coach, uh, you know, uh, Antonio Conte, like the club has to show the ambition and a head of department needs to work. Mm. And that's it. And in, in my mind, like Guillaume's ambition was always, we want to build a profitable business, but we also want to build a brand. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, like my trigger for marketing was, I was always really enthusiastic about cool commercials on TV, on radio. Uh, I was always like thinking about why the hell do people like Apple? And I've never seen an Apple ad. There must be no reason then on the university you learn, okay, marketing, branding, blah, blah, blah. And fast forward to Lamlist. Okay, the company wants to invest in everything. This is the thing I've been waiting for. And the fact that you have that support from the top, you have support from your colleagues to build that type of a thing. We said, okay, let's create content that just brings value. Obviously, not every single content piece that we created was good. There were some missed shots. But I don't think it's too much. Like, I think in general, we received great word of mouth through it. And branding wise and positioning wise, it was in the back. Job well done. 100%. So when you joined, do you remember how many clients there were? Like paying I don't clients? remember the number. Honestly, I can tell you that. So the company has done beta launch on Product Hunt. The company has done AppSumo. Mm -hmm. And because the company had an office, they were part of Station F a famous accelerator slash however you want to call it in startup hub in Paris. Yeah. And so Guillaume as a person who's really good at networking in general, I consider this one of his best skills. He was already finding clients in the station F. Zendesk became a client because Zendesk was, uh, the Lamlist was under the Zendesk program in station F. Got it. And so he was able to bring Zendesk as an early client, which was impressive. And so there were already some clients, there, were, there was the community, but uh, revenue-wise, it was still relatively small. Mm. There was some revenue coming in, but I, I don't really remember a particular number. That's, that, that's totally fine. Okay, so you guys were doing a community, you guys were doing content on LinkedIn, and you were creating like blogs. I'm assuming it was not just pure organic play, it was, more, it was also SEO type of stuff. So basically there were a few channels that you guys were utilizing, which was completely different than let's say a normal playbook for a SaaS company of, yeah. or with a ticket of that size, which would be paid ads, right? Yeah. And you blew it up real fast. Is that kind of the, the channels that you were utilizing? Yeah. Depends on the time frame. You got to consider that I think in the early days, there were a couple of, of hundreds of users. Some users were, as you know, when you start and there's a company in station F, you exchange uh, products for free. So mm -hmm. not every client was a paid client. Early Balkan people, so Serbians, Croatians, Bosnians, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Macedonia, whatever, we were always making some sort of like cool deals initially. But as every startup, young startup and us 
young in our roles and and not super super experienced we made tons of mistakes like we were trying to do everything at some point a couple of months Guillaume was talking to big companies mm -hmm. and i was doing some experiments on the growth side with the small companies and then after that we realized okay the big companies is not ideal because they're not converting due to the privacy security reasons that the big clients have long sales cycles etc and so we decided okay let's focus let's try to do a couple of things that we can do well and so we already had the community and the community was vibrant from the start mm -hmm. even when it had like just a small number of, of members and then the next layer the next channel that we added was content while Guillaume was trying to close big companies one of the things that i did is i was creating content without an idea of what are some of the priority topics that we should address. I was writing about anything that I considered as popular, which was a mistake and a waste of time. And then talking with Guillaume, we realized, hey, let's just do cold email templates. No guides, no LinkedIn, no nothing. Just cold email templates. Why? Because we have our own experience, both him and I in it. So we have some campaigns to utilize. Plus, authority-wise, we're speaking about something that we're doing, which brings a little bit of credibility. Secondly, we were using Lemlist to sell Lemlist. So we will always have a supply of unique, authentic campaigns that we can utilize and offer something new. And thirdly, it was a positioning type of a thing. We realized that uh, if you Googled cold email templates back in the day, you were seeing stuff usually on a HubSpot blog or something like that, a very big website with a lot of uh, traffic. And it felt like marketers writing templates that were never set. Some of them, yes, but most of them, not really. And there were no results. Nobody was saying this was the reply rate. This is the total number of emails. It was just like the templates. And we started doing, okay, all of that as our differentiation of some sort. And finally, the, one of the most important thing is like cold email templates. Hmm. They ticked most important boxes. You can do product placement that makes sense. Our key differentiator back in the day, even before Lamborn, custom images, nobody had that. And so we just, we can showcase that easily. And those articles are good for prospects to drive them to free trial, but it, they were also good for users to boost retention. Mm -hmm. And so it ticked all the boxes. We took that page out of Ahrefs book, mm -hmm. how to yeah. prioritize content. We didn't do anything about SEO like our at, at that point. Like we were just shipping templates. As soon as the template goes out, we ship it to the community. We ship it to the newsletter. I go to Quora. I go to whatever I can, Growth, Hackers, Digest, like whatever channel made sense, we were trying to get there. And that was one of the early things that we did that worked really well. The coffee cup template yeah. that Guillaume created was blew up. Like then a couple of other templates that him and I created also started blowing up as well. And the users were coming. Are you looking to acquire new or improve your existing cold outreach skills? Whether you're trying to break into cold outreach or you're already doing some outbound sales, we have a home for you. Join our community for cold outreach and attend exclusive cold outreach workshops, master classes with big cold outreach and cold outbound sales names, or choose to take one of our courses and complete them at your own pace. The link to join is in the description below. All right. Back to the show. I'm getting flashbacks because I, I was looking at what you guys were doing and I was trying out those templates and for the most part, they would work. What really did the job for me actually was we were using Outreach at the time, Outreach.io in my company yeah. that I was working in. And we were getting, let's say, 30 to 50% open rates. And um, when I came on board, it was normal to have a 30% open rate and I don't know, point something reply rate and you got to send 10,000 emails to get a few answers. And then there was you guys who would send like a yeah. hundred emails and get 20 responses. It was like yeah. something doesn't add up. And so I started consuming your content. That was the positioning thing. Mm -hmm. I think like positioning is one of the most important things starting out and it, it and at, at every stage of the company, like you want to have something that's uniquely different about you. It doesn't have to be like an amazing feature. It mm. can be just that your tool is faster. That could be a differentiation. It could be that it's simpler, but some sort of something that's different. And 
custom images and then a few months later Lamworm were the two unique things that were completely different. And there was a lot of just wrong opinions in the market back then, like that images sent you to spam, yeah. wrong, that you got to have a huge list to incentivize reply rate to go up, wrong. You just learn that by doing. And I knew that from Shift. Like mm -hmm. we were having like these huge lists for conferences and everything. We were getting replies, but the reply rate was never 10, let alone 20%. Yeah. Just because you're creating generic stuff. And then you go back, okay, why did Guillaume respond to my email? Because it was tailored to them and to Lamlist. And then it was always like question, what's the right balance? Like I can't really super personalize every single email for every single prospect, but I can become smart with segmenting, with doing these creative things. And nobody was doing that. And positioning wise, if you went to a Mailshake website or Woodpecker or whoever, they were always sending automation, which mm -hmm. is nothing wrong with that. But our positioning was personalize, send less to convert more. Like it was completely different. And then it became a movement. Again, goes back to branding and why we thought it was a cool thing back then. It was just beautiful to see it all. As I look at it from an entrepreneurial and marketing perspective, it was just beautiful to see it all develop. But there's this huge component of you were, from my perspective, you were sharing amazingly valuable things that, that, and then when things are valuable, people want to share them. I was sharing yep. them. I was consuming them. I was trying them out and, and I was getting the results that you were promising. So you were delivering on those promises. You did one more thing, which I think is just genius. And I think it's your signature move. Maybe I'm wrong, um, which is uh, actually building and scaling the community. And so I know that you had a Facebook community and literally everyone that, or was a user was sent to that community where you guys yep. shared again, the useful things. And it grew like crazy. I was a part of that. And it was yeah. on Facebook back then, right? Yeah, it was on Facebook. It was always a team effort. Like, I think everybody was participating. Guillaume initially, then me and Guillaume, then Ilya joined. Mm. Then I don't even remember. But there's Brie at some point was doing things in community. There was some interns that uh, also participated. Like, it was always a team effort, to be honest. But yeah, everybody was motivated to go to community. And if you go back to the beta launch on Product Hunt, as soon as they launched it, everybody was invited to community to streamline feedback. And like Figma, to make customers feel like they're building the tool. It wasn't obvious. I, I don't think it was like that sort of deep thinking when it started. But as you were doing it, you realized the potential uh, of a community. And if you think about Lamworm, that's how the idea came. Like it was one of the users of Lamlist who said, okay, let's do manual email warm up, And then it was like, click, we can do this. The two co tech co-founders, they released the beta feature, like I think in, in record time, like it was 10, 15 days after that post in the community, it was given for free to everybody in the community. They were enthusiastic. Nobody had such a feature. And when you add Lamworm and custom images and personalization together, like this was a complete package now. Yeah. Like you don't go to spam and you get high replies. The beta access to Lamworm enabled us to perfect a couple of things, to iron a few things. We launched it. All the users who participated early on, they had it for free for a, a longer time than anybody else. So that type of uh, relationship with users, I feel like it was one of the best things that Lamless did. And before LinkedIn comes into place, there was always customer success. Anna, as a head of success, customer success joined couple of months later than me, but even before she joined, there was three founders and me doing customer success. When Anna joined, we were all doing it. And then Anna built her own team. But the customer success was, the idea was like, if you go to a cool bar and everybody you talk to, it feels like fun. And I realized that before when we were doing it and I was participating, I was talking to both users and prospects. Mm -hmm. Usually you're fixing a problem. But when you fix a problem or troubleshoot whatever you need to troubleshoot, you can ask things. And I can ask, okay, what templates are you missing right now? And then people will tell you, I don't have to do content research. I just need to match. If I'm doing SEO, I just need to match what they're saying with the keyword volume and keyword difficulty and then do it. But even without SEO, you still have intent and the desire of your ideal prospect or customers. You were selling stuff. 
because we were all using Lamlist all the time, I could speak to anybody about Lamlist because I know every single feature. And that's one of the key things in marketing. Like I feel marketers who don't use their, some products are difficult to use. Like you can't use all the products, but you got to figure out a way to use it just because you have enough evidence that gives you confidence to talk to anybody. Yep. And customer success was really a wing van, wing man or a wing woman to marketing all the time because as soon as Anna took over, she and I, we kept a really close communication about these things. And when customer success people joined, the team was a couple of people. They were all mostly Balkan with some French. I was randomly calling every single one of them from time to time just to talk about, okay, how are you doing? How's life? Da, da, da. And what interesting tickets have you had recently? And they would ask me some things about marketing and that communication brought so much good stuff, I think, to both teams and every single individual in those teams. And they maybe I would consider this as a second smart thing that we did as a company because you have the ability to sell. Like we had a lot of free trialers coming in at some point and a huge percentage of them go to customer success. Right. Sometimes it's a problem. Sometimes it's, hey, my reply rate is low. What can I do? And then customer success, hey, there's this community packed with tactics. If you're not already part of it, go. There's this blog article, check it out. There's this video, there's this whatever. And so if you think about it, it was another channel to be utilized with direct communication with the person who already has some sort of interest. Definitely. It does seem that talking to your customers constantly brings you amazing results. Somehow people end up not talking with their customers and missing out on those insights that other ones yeah. they would have gotten. But it, it seems like it's a huge no-brainer. But what I'm curious about right now, because the audience that's being built around this podcast specifically is founders and people are just trying to launch things and I want to keep it actionable. So do you have an advice or what you would do to like replicate what Lemless did? How do you start that community from scratch and make sure it's actually growing and it's valuable to its customers and users? Yeah, it's a little bit tougher uh, every year just because of the amount of communities that's consistently popping. But it's the reason why it's tough is because unlike blog, where you can post one or two articles or 10 articles a week mm -hmm. and you can still have some sort of impact, community is 24-7. Mm. Like I join a community, I don't know, on a Monday and there are no po posts till Thursday. There's only 50 members and nobody's active. Those are the typically challenges you face when you're doing it from scratch. So I think you need to adjust and understand that, okay, it's not having a lot of members is nice, but if you have only 50 people, that doesn't mean that the community has to be boring or whatever. You shouldn't invite friends who have nothing to do with the business proposition or this industry in particular. You just have to invite a couple of people that are cool. One thing that we did at Lamlist. Like I was uh, creating pods uh, because we didn't have any SEO. Like I will, I had to be a little bit creative. Where are we going to get traffic? And so I started create, joining pods, Facebook groups, Telegram chats, like what have you. And then I realized, okay, best parties in high school were the parties that happened in my place because I was the host and everybody wants to talk to me. Like all the girls, all everybody. And it should work in the business world. And I started creating pods. I had one when, where Ilya was in, and that's how we got close. And I asked him to join Lamlist at some point, but I started creating these LinkedIn chats, one LinkedIn chat, second LinkedIn chat, third, fifth, and I came to 10th. The limit was 10 people per chat. We just exchanged link, links and then engage on each other's content. And then there were too many chats and okay, this is now a community because there's like a valid proposition. These people are active. I can move them to this community that ultimately had thousands. It wasn't a really a community. It was still a pod and it was a LinkedIn group. I expected LinkedIn group, LinkedIn to invest in group features, to compete with Facebook. They never did that, but still I had a hypothesis that they might. And then at some point I might have turned that pod into a content community should I had enough motivation to do it. And LinkedIn did some cool things. LinkedIn didn't do it. My motivation was really high to have another community. So I gave it to some other people who inherited that uh, group. But it started like this. I validated there's like a promise. People were active. And then that's the thing. Like you got to find something in the community that uh, triggers people. Uh, right. Something that feels like, okay, 
is the point of the community for us to post frequently or is it something else? Is it because there are some cool events once a week and it's just that event that people know that on a Wednesday, this massively cool event that's closed, not for a lot of people will happen and you do the positioning and the promotion, right? Like it can be anything, but it has to be valuable and you have to have a discipline of bringing value consistently. And then the community increases, you get another challenge. And I have a lot of members. Mm. What do I do? You exhaust your initial topics, which happens. What do I do next? And so that's why it's tricky. It's one of the toughest channels, honestly. But it seems like if you actually figure out how to make it work, it just blasts off and really well, yeah it's your own distribution channel yeah. it's your own distribution channel and the reason why lamless work is the product had uh, unique features that were cool enough and the product seemed like nice and it can do some cool things and people wanted to give feedback people wanted to check out templates people wanted to figure out how to use these couple of things and that's why the community worked there was some sort of yeah. value and the activity was high Mm, and I think that whether that activity is still alive, I think it was called Lemlister of the week or something like that. Yeah. And so the people from the community using Lemlist, like they would brag about their results. It was usually yeah. agency owners or whatever. I, I remember how cool that was because I could actually go in and find people who are doing the same thing as I am and then like copy it or whatever. Yeah. That was such a huge thing. Yeah. And that goes back to those templates. Like early days, we create templates and share our own. And the reason why... You, people like those templates is because we, those were my templates. Like we didn't have any, uh, obviously like Guillaume, Zilia, it's not just yeah. templates. Those were our templates. And uh, the reason why they worked is I, we didn't have any fear that if I share a template, somebody will steal and my template will stop working, which was a legitimate fear. Like I'm sharing something that works and competitors can replicate. But we were like, okay, we will always be adapting our templates. And if I'm a one hit wonder all with one template, I don't deserve to yeah. compete anyway. I should die. And we started sharing them. And then people started sharing their screenshots, their reply rate, their template. And I was like, okay, Lamb Lister of the Week idea was originated. And we started sharing templates and telling people, hey, we can showcase your template. You get exposure to community. You get exposure to newsletters, thousands of people. You get the backlink from a legitimate website. We can link to your LinkedIn profile. And for agencies, it was particularly interesting because they were getting clients from it as well. Yep. And so then, okay, Lamless Partners idea came. Then with all those templates, now we have enough to create an ebook. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, if you think about it, like the first decision that we made, let's do cold email templates content wise, but we didn't, we weren't really thinking about all this. And then as we were going, the opportunity is open and then you just capitalize on them. Nice. That's so impressive. So I'm thinking like right now, Lendlist is at 20 plus million ARR. It was at 13 when you left. It took you a bunch of mistakes to figure out, oh, so this is what we need to do. And so how would you suggest someone to focus on what to focus on? Should people only do cold emails? Should people start creating some kind of content? Should they start investing time in a community? Like how does one figure out what is the best like venue to go after without really going nowhere? Yeah. So I think there are two aspects. Number one is where are your customers spending time? Mm. But Doing that research is not like I Google a couple of things. I visit a few subreddits and then I have an idea. Like you speak to customers, you speak to prospects, you don't get depressed if a reply rate is initially low. Like in all these ups and downs, you do a thorough research and then you realize, okay, let's say for example, there are 20 channels hmm. and my customers are active on these eight. And so now it's a question of, your plan and your resources. Okay, I have eight channels, but I have 10 hours a day or 24 hours a day if you're a lunatic. And how can I maximize the impact? Do I do all eight and maybe bring two people on board because I have an investment or whatever? Or if I don't have a, a big of a budget, I need to prioritize. And then which of these eight channels, I think which two will bring me the highest ROI. And then you have a certain hypothesis and then you focus on it. 
if you go back to Lamless, that that was community, then it was content, then customer success, then LinkedIn, then YouTube. If you asked Guillaume and me back when we were doing just content, do we want to do YouTube? Do we want to do LinkedIn? Hell yeah, we want to do it. But we just can't because we will be doing average type of work just because we don't have enough time to do everything. So you prioritize. And then you have a, some sort of a scoreboard that tells you if what you're doing is bringing results. And then if it isn't, then you think about it. Is it because we're not doing an optimal job in this channel? Or is it because the other channel that I thought is not as important as this one is a better option? Yeah. Sometimes maybe you're not that good in building your distribution network. Maybe you can consider utilizing other people's distribution network. So if I can't build a huge Instagram profile at this point, maybe I go to an influencer, maybe I go to a community, maybe I go to a website that has a lot of relevant traffic and I do something. If you think about one of the first things that Guillaume did, he created an article. That's a story I told a thousand times, but he went to a Saster conference. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any cash back in the day. He was just starting out. And so he applied to be a volunteer at the at Saster conference. He got a free ticket to go, but he also got access to the list of attendees. He took the last list of attendees, created the Lemless campaign with uh, all the key features, booked, I don't remember, 44 or 55 meetings, and then used this as a case study after the conference to post about it. And he didn't post it on the Lemless website because it had no traffic. He posted it on a Medium publication that had a bunch of small businesses, entrepreneurs reading it. And that was one of the articles that motivated me to apply. And he utilized other channels and he started building language channels, but they weren't big enough for him to use this. So it's those types of decisions, whether where are my customers spending time? Do I understand? What do I prioritize? And then it all comes down to execution. How do you position? How do you promote? How do you match your product solutions to the pains that or challenges that customer face. There's that famous sentence in all marketing books, sell the hole, not the drill. Mm. You got to figure that out. And then you just analyze, okay, it's working. It's not working. And it's always both. Some things are not working. Some things are working. And as I listen to you and as I envision this thread of, of what you guys have been doing and how one thing led to another, a cool thing about podcasts is that, and talking with people in this way is that I can actually see into the past and see what's common for every part of each stage of what you guys did. And why, what I think happened is actually there was a product that was solving a specific problem. Mm -hmm. And there were like a huge number of small iterations and constantly having this quick feedback loops. So send a cold email campaign, get some results, publish the results, talk to the customers, get feedback from customers, make an incremental change on the product or whatever, repeat, repeat. And then you, you created this community by sharing what you guys were doing, which was actually solving a problem. So I think at, at the end of everything, you were vocal about solving problems in an effective way, uh, that, but it was actually solving yeah. a problem. And then it just snowballed into something that's worth 20, 23 million right now, which is a cool story yeah. in, in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. It's that uh, famous Kobe Bryant quote, you put one foot in front of the other and never look back. When you're a kid and you read that stuff, you feel like it's fluff. Yeah. But when you start actually doing, you realize that it's the discipline that really matters and the know-how to understand that, for example, I can run Facebook ads, which in retrospect, Lambless became really profitable fast. We, we should have started running ads earlier. We just needed to have somebody who knows how to do it. And then if you have both organic and paid, maybe we would hit 50 million. You will never know. It's just like a, a thought in my mind. But what I wanted to say is you can run Facebook ads for a month or two. They might not bring results. People who are running them are people who are not that experienced in it. And then they label Facebook ads as yeah, they're not working. Yeah. It's not that they're not working. It's that we don't know how to utilize them. Mm. Or... We just didn't have enough experiments to say with confidence, this is not working for us because we really tried everything. And that's also happens. We made that mistake a bunch of times. SEO was a nightmare first two years for me until I finally realized that I'm dumb to do it and I need somebody smarter. And then I learned from them. Just like, it's not working and I need somebody who's uh, more senior. And then you just bring that person to explain and, and that's it. I think... 
discipline plus assessing that scoreboard thing. Like you have to have some sort of a report that doesn't just tell you numbers, but that gives you insights. And then you transform those insights into action steps. Okay. I'm dumb for SEO, but I realized that because I spent 12 months or 24 months doing the exact same thing and the results weren't really getting increasing 50%. They were increasing 5%. 5% is not enough. We need to hit 50% to, to put a dent. So those are the types of things I think it comes down to. And that's where, for example, mentorship comes into play. Mm -hmm. I realized that Hunter was a competitor of Loveless. And besides Woodpecker, because they had a cool mascot, but Hunter was my favorite competitor. And they were crushing SEO. And Guillaume, we were sitting one, uh, one night in the office and uh, he told me, imagine if Hunter and us merge. Or if we buy them, it was like a, you know, a fantasy. And uh, you merge two teams. We are good at these channels and Hunter folks are good at this. And Guillaume knew the founder of uh, Hunter anyway. And obviously never happened, but it was just like a thought. And I realized that Irina, who was the head of marketing and head of growth in, at Hunter, is not working in Hunter anymore. And so I have a client right now that also is a content-driven company. And I booked a, a consulting call with her and with a bunch of other SEO people just to ask them okay, I'm curious, like I know SEO, but I want to know even more. And so let me ask you, how did Hunter beat us? And obviously, Irina being a loyal person, she said, I, I can't really tell you all the secret stuff, but I can tell you things that can help you do a successful right. project somewhere else. And then you learn, huh, that's why they thought, that's why they did. And then you draw some conclusions on your own and you understand. And you need that to be able to get results. Otherwise, you're just staying in the same place. Yeah, you've built a very impressive reputation by being very public about the things that you're doing. I know, like I follow your LinkedIn posts when you post them. What's the future? What do you see happening going forward? Do you see a, an interesting company on the horizon that you might join? Or do you see yourself being a consultant for some time and just growing that into a an even bigger business and helping more companies grow? I have no idea, dude. I honestly don't even put any type of pressure to have like a detailed plan for the future. Like I have a plan for the next two years of my consulting approximately, how it looks like and what are some of the projects that I want to do. Now that could happen. I could modify those projects with the new findings along the way or if I join with some other people, but there's a plan in motion. However, there might come a time where there's a winery that's really massive in Italy that asks me to do marketing for them. And then I completely switch industries and everything and go into that. So I don't really, business-wise at least, I keep a, a mind open. Right now, consulting is fun. I like it. Even if I get an offer to join my favorite club in Milan, I wouldn't join until I finish what I promised to my clients. It's just the way I'm framed. But life-wise, I just want to be happy as much as I can. I want to spend time with the folks. That's a thing that I have you know, planned, like where I want to go with my girlfriend, what I want to do with my friends. And I'm really diligent in planning that. But business-wise, you just can't anticipate stuff. AI will change things, I'm pretty sure. And then the consulting that I'm doing today, maybe the consulting, if I end up doing it forever, who knows what I will be doing in five years. How will consulting look like in that time? But I'm pretty sure I'll figure it out. So I don't really put any pressure. Worst comes to worst. My mom hates this story. I told her there was like a project that I quit in the early days and she, she and I didn't have a plan B. I was like, I, I don't care. I, I don't want to do this. It's not me and bye. And she told me like, what are you going to do? I'm going to find another gig. Should be relatively fast. There's like a bunch of job ads anyway. But if it doesn't happen, I'm just going to drive a taxi. And I'll drive a taxi, get some cash, pay my bills. And then in the meantime, find a job without the pressure of not having money. Yeah. And I have no problem if my high school friends that are successful come into my taxi and then they're like, oh, look, it look like he's driving a cab. Like, I don't care. I just don't care. And my mom was like, my son with a master's degree to drive a taxi. Come on. Like you, you spent years of you, you studying and everything and you have, I do. It's just like a timeout for me to figure the next step. So I think that's just the way I roll. I know it is the way you roll. I'm going to leave us with, with this. And you just reminded me, Patrick Beth Davis, I think that's his name. I think he said this, 
the universe is going to pay you what you're worth regardless of the situation that you are in basically your skill set and your the, the amount of value that you and your personality bring to the world that is by definition like that's going to happen that's going to be achieved and so uh, i don't think that even like worst comes to worst you would actually have to drive a taxi i have a few of my friends have the same type of an opinion that you just mentioned but, but for me you, you never know who knows who knows anything can happen but the thing that that matters in my mind and is like you do what you can you try to control what you can control and sometimes it's not going to work out mm -hmm. you're going to fall in love with a girl that you're never going to uh, catch you're going to Uh, love this company that will never hire you. But as long as you tried everything, I'm good with that. That's so rich. Great. It didn't work. Let's find something that will work. Uh, Beautiful, man. That's it. Okay. Okay. So it's okay. We will definitely do this uh, again. Until then, where can people uh, find you? How do they contract you and contact you? And uh, what kind of companies do you prefer working with? Yeah, I'm pretty, let's say, active on LinkedIn, but I have every single social media platform i'm afraid like a profile and i keep a zero unresponded messages in in my inboxes like at least for now and i try to keep it that way <laughs> forever but yeah linkedin is probably the best place in terms of clients i tend to work most with the to be saas companies i started doing a little bit of e-commerce i'm a little bit in the ai space but as long as the project is interesting and i can fly the friendly skies with the vision that, that people have, I can probably adjust. And in terms of where I can bring ROI, it's organic marketing stuff mostly. So if it's like paid ads or things, there's probably a bunch of consultants that are better than me. But organic inbound marketing, that's my spiel. Beautiful. Beautiful. I really appreciate you for coming on the show and sharing this piece of your playbook with us. Yes, sir. Thanks for the invite. 100%. Take care. Bye.